Sarah Shulman is Distinguished Professor of the Humanities at the City University of New York College of Staten Island. She's co-founder of the ACT UP Oral History Project and MIX, the New York Queer Experimental Film Festival. Among her books that have become modern classics are the novels Rat Bohemia and People in Trouble, and nonfiction Israel-Palestine and the Queer International, The Gentrification of the Mind, Witness to a Lost Imagination, and My American History, Lesbian and Gay Life During the Reagan-Bush Years, her 17th book, the Cosmopolitans has just been released, and she just starred in a film, Jason and Shirley. She's also my very long-term friend. Sarah, welcome to the program. Welcome back, I should say. Thank you. So, Jason and Shirley, who's Shirley? Well, in 1966, a very innovative experimental filmmaker named Shirley Clark, oh. who lived in the Chelsea Hotel, uh, interviewed a black gay man named Jason Holliday for 12 hours and edited it down to 90 minutes. And this was the film Portrait of Jason, which is the very first record on film of a black gay man mm. in cinema. Portrait of Jason, roll one, sound one. And it's a very complicated film. It has some interesting things. It has some very exploitative things. Some of it is very distressing. Uh, but for 50 years, it's been this key film in the, in the canon. Some people like museums, and they spend all day looking at pictures. I spent all day looking at people. It's the same form of art. And then a black gay director, Stephen Winter, decided to make a film speaking back finally to, to Portrait of Jason. So he cast me to play Shirley Clark. He cast my beloved friend of 30 years, Jack Waters, to play Jason Holliday. We built a set that looked like the interior of the Chelsea Hotel in 1966, because of course, of course the real Chelsea's been gentrified. And we did a 12-hour improv in which we recreated the original 12-hour shoot. We shot everything, and then he edited it down to 74 minutes, and that's our film, Jason and Shirley. And how can people see it? Uh, very soon it will be available online. Right now we're showing it in museums and film festivals. We'll play a clip. This is Jason, our star. Ooh, who's oh. this crazy cat? That's some hot chicken you got cooking, baby. Pleased to meet you. Nico. Charmed, I'm sure. <laughs> this is Saul, who's going to be the DP. Saul, how are you doing? Nico, can you take it's these just got some props, some of my, some of my swaying stuff. Thank you can take this, thank okay, you very let's much. Go. Yes, Service with a smile. Seat, and well, let's let's see smile. Okay, right? I can work with him if you want, okay, want me yeah, to. Okay, yeah, I want you to. But I, I really... I want you to work with him. That was great. Is that, in movies maybe your new your new career? No, because even though I look like I'm acting, actually it was improv, so I was actually writing <laughs> as I moved. I don't think I could really learn lines. So whether there are more movies in your future or not, there is this incredible new novel, The Cosmopolitans, that I'm recommending to everybody. It is another take on your ode to New York, very different from your other work. You've talked about gentrification in nonfiction form. Now you're talking about it in a novel. What is Sarah Shulman's New York? What's the New York you love so much? It's the mix. You know, it's a... Uh, and the novel engages the affordable New York, where all different kinds of people are living together, and your daily life experience is about confronting difference and changing yourself in relationship to, to others. Uh, there's a certain kind of knowledge that comes from living in the public sphere, which is what New York living is like. And you learn that people suffer, you learn that there's contradictions, you learn that people have different points of view, and it's enriching, and it's enhancing of our own you know, experience. The character that tells some of this story, or one of the characters that tells this story in your really wonderful new novel, The Cosmopolitans, is Bette, who comes here from Ohio, 1958, um, is where you start the book. Talk about why that moment to start the book. She came in the 20s, but, but what was happening in 58 to cite your story there? Well, 1958 is a really interesting time. Uh, you know, we had, after the war, there was an economic boom, and um, there was a lot of rhetoric about the American dream, and there's all this opportunity for everybody. But it's also the period before the key political movements, before the women's movement, before the black movement really got going, certainly before gay liberation. So if you are a person who doesn't fit into the norm, you're out there on your own mm. trying to access this mythological dream. But also in New York, while, on, while nationally we're in a period of regression and McCarthyism and all of this, in New York we're in a period of great experimentation, bohemianism and mixing, which later produces the 60s. 
You have artists, you have advertising people, you have TV people coming in. That becomes a big part of the story. You want to tell people a little bit of what this novel deals with? Well, it's uh, based on Balzac's Cousin Bet, uh, which is a novel about a spinster who is betrayed by her family and decides to get revenge. And of course, that story always stuck with me, one of my <laughs> favorites from college. Um, but so then I was thinking about setting it in Greenwich Village. And of course, once you get into the 50s and the early 60s, the prototypical model is Another Country by mm -hmm. James Baldwin, which also engages the same kind of characters as my book, black and white, gay and straight, male and female. Only the representation of women from that era is very paltry. I mean, there are some memoirs by people like Diane de Prima and Joyce Johnson that go back to that time. Um, and there were bohemian novelists like Don Powell from an earlier era. But really, that 50s, 60s bohemianism, was, women did not uh, fare well in mm -hmm. literary representations. So you went in to fill the gap. Yes, exactly. <laughs> And how do you make sense of the narratives we're told about how change happens and how change happened in that period? Um, artists often get the blame, don't they? In terms of gentrification. Yeah, that kind of change. You know, there was a lot of mythology about what, what caused gentrification in New York City, and two groups that were really blamed were artists and white gay men. They were both ex fundamentally blamed for gentrification. But now that we're more adult and we understand how things actually work, gentrification was policy. Mm -hmm. There was a deliberate decision to stop building low-income housing and to start giving tax breaks to luxury developers like Donald Trump, who built all of his uh, luxury buildings with corporate welfare mm. based on our tax money. I said it was law and lending. That's right. So. Well, you like to say, you know, we are growing up and we know better, but people don't know better. This is not a well-known story still, I don't think. Well, I think that the, the origins of contemporary gentrification start with, um, after World War II, the GI Bill. And this was a way for the federal government to give, give a lot of money to developers who were creating the suburbs through the bodies of the vets. So the vets got very low income, very low interest loans to buy housing in the suburbs, but the suburbs were racist and it was only for white people. Mm -hmm. So this is the period that we call white flight after World War II where a lot of ethnic whites take advantage of these loans and move out of the city. And this is the time of low rents, open city, a lot of political movements are starting to develop. And then in the 70s, and I think it's a, really a reaction to the radicalism of urban life in the 60s and 70s, we start to see redevelopment. The initial myth was that the city was broke and that by bringing in richer people, we would expand our tax base. But as we all know now, New York is overflowing with rich people mm -hmm. and all of our public services are in disarray. So that was clearly a lie. And then, and then we see the development of luxury housing and it's aimed at the children of white flight, mm -hmm. the children of these people who move to the suburbs, who come to New York having been suburbanized, which is a new phen cultural phenomena. And they want to trade freedom for security. They come from the gated community mentality. And they want things that are familiar. They've lost that taste for difference mm -hmm. that has always come to represent the city, city That's life. That's very much the story that you write up in The Gentrification of the Mind, that book. Right. Remind me and, and the audience how this came into your life, how you started hearing these different attitudes. I think it was your students, right? No. I. Um, you know, it's funny because I've been publishing novels since 1984, which is quite a long time. And if I look back at my early novels, I can see that gentrification is happening in the background of everyone's life, but I don't really know what it is. Mm -hmm. Suddenly there's all these regular white people. Suddenly there's cash machines. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, and only at about uh, five or 10 years into it did I realize, oh, this is, this is what's happening. Mm -hmm. This is planned development. But it lurks in the background earlier. So I, I, I understood it from the beginning, but in an in instinctive way. But in terms of people's attitudes, I mean, that's what you're getting at in what you had just said, is people are bringing different attitudes along with those things changing on the street. Well, you know, um, there's also this very strong correlation between gentrification and the AIDS crisis. And that's something that I address in my book, Gentrification of the Mind. Because don't forget that the AIDS crisis began in 1981, which is right at the beginning of the high point of, mm. of the kickstarting of gentrification. 
And so you have key neighborhoods where you have very high death rates. And those neighborhoods now are among some of the most gentrified neighborhoods in the mm -hmm. city. East Village, West Village, Lower East Side, Harlem, Chelsea. In fact, the two most gentrified cities in America are New York and San Francisco. Mm -hmm. So you have a lot of people dying and apartments going to market rate with great rapidity in key neighborhoods just at the time of gentrification. And that's certainly a factor in turning things over. It seems like this whole story is related to our policing crisis, too. How do you see that? Well, I mean, now we're seeing our mayor trying to gentrify Brownsville, East New York. You know, he, he doesn't want, I mean, uh, developers do not want there to be any kind of autonomous people of color neighborhoods right. left in New York. And through the guise of what they call affordable housing, which is not affordable, they're going to systematically gentrify those neighborhoods. So to go back to this question of this being a scary time, uh, you have a forthcoming book that you're working on around fear. Um, you talk about overstating harm. How does that connect to all of this? And how did this previous work l lead you to that? So I have two books this year. The Cosmopolitans is a novel that came out in March. And then next October, I have uh, probably, I would say, my magnum opus, Life's Work, is coming out. It's called Conflict is Not Abuse. And um, it's about what I call overstating harm. It's about the conflation of conflict and abuse. Let me explain what I mean. Yeah. To me, uh, abuse is power over. When one party can control another party's behavior. But conflict is something that's power struggle. It's a mutual, two parties are both participating in creating the problem. But when we pretend that conflict is abuse, we, we give up the uh, responsibility of recognizing our own role. And in this way, we uh, demonize the other. Now, that takes place in interpersonal relationships. It takes place in relationships between citizens and the state. And it takes place geopolitically. And so in the book, I address this, this problem of overstating harm in order to avoid acknowledging our own contribution mm. in everything from domestic violence rhetoric to HIV criminalization to the rhetoric of Israel Explain Palestine. Explain what you mean. I mean, I get it that you and I having a dispute about something doesn't necessarily mean I'm being harmed. Right. But there's a trend now for people to very casually use words like harassment, abuse, um, stalking, these kinds of things, to actually describe casually uncomfortable mm -hmm. normative conflicts. So when people say, I don't feel safe in the middle of a, of a discussion, conversation. That's right. That's right. And what that does is it whitewashes the experience of people who are actually yeah. being abused. Uh, it makes everything generic. And then we have, then we're all absented from the process of peacemaking and um, reconciliation. Mm, mm. So for example, when the government, let's take the example of HIV criminalization, you know, Michael Johnson, who just got a 30 year sentence in Missouri for infecting somebody with HIV. Um, when the government tells people, if you have sex with somebody who's HIV positive and they don't disclose, as is the case in Canada, for example, you should call the police and denounce them, and they will be incarcerated. Now, this is now the law in the in, in all throughout Canada. It's a standard of law, and there's currently 150 people in prison in Canada who have never infected anybody. Yeah. They're there for non-disclosure. When that when that happens, the government is encouraging people to see themselves as criminally wronged, when actually they're just anxious, mm. when actually there has been no harm. It's just that because HIV is so stigmatized. So whether or not you use safe sex, whether, or whether whatever actually happens, you, there's this question of the, the status of the person and whether they've told you right. that they are HIV positive. So instead of us all learning how to deal with our anxieties about HIV and to stop stigmatizing people with HIV, the government is telling us that we've been criminally wronged. Right. And this enhances the, the power of the government. Mm -hmm. it, Every time you and I cannot figure out a conflict <laughs> and I call the police or claim that I'm a victim or something like that, when actually we're just having a normative disagreement, I'm enhancing the power mm. of the state. Mm. And the state exploits this. And so that's why we have this globalized moment right now where people are constantly overstating harm, constantly. Um, and 
if you look at the example of Israel and Palestine, that's the greatest example. I was going to ask you if you learned any of this thinking from your experience of work in that part of the Absolutely. world. Absolutely. I mean, uh, in the years that I've been pro-Palestinian and that I've had to evolve and challenge what I was taught by m about myself and by my family and all of this mythology that I was raised with, I've come to understand that there's a real rhetoric of avoiding the fact that Israel, are the, Israel, Israel is the perpetrator. Mm -hmm. And yet they use a rhetoric of victimization to mask that they are actually causing harm. Mm -hmm. and, and when I saw that there, I could see that it manifests among people I know, for example, who casually do the same thing. Mm -hmm. And there's a, there's a trend in that direction because it enhances the power of the state. Mm -hmm. So we're all being manipulated to enhance the power of the police and the state by overstating harm. And it makes it really easy for candidates like Donald Trump to address people's fears or talk about fear and, and suggest that they And it makes it easy for police officers to shoot black men for selling cigarettes in Staten Island. And women who are having nervous breakdowns. <laughs> they say that they're afraid. That's right. Sarah Shulman's new book is The Cosmopolitans. It's a novel out now. Get yourself a copy. Read it. She has a book coming out this fall that we'll tell you more about when that comes out. Thanks so much. Thank you, Laura. I think the more that people have to work with in their communities, the more they'll build. Laura Flanders show producer Jordan Flaherty caught up with musician Lupe Fiasco. He's starting a new life as an entrepreneurial investor. And our mission is to turn around and change the landscape of mental health out there for poverty-stricken neighborhoods and beyond.